Companies Act. A special presentation by The Firm. The key point is to clearly lay out that the definition of subsidiary under the Companies Act is relevant for the purposes of compliance with the provisions of the Companies Act other than preparation of the financial statement. The way the law has defined it is internal financial controls and it talks of even orderly and efficient conduct of the business. Yes. That is too sweeping. Thank you for having a joint venture. Mm. Then that joint venture, there is no exemption provided in case the local law says it has to be a different accounting year. So the exemption is not possible. So then it cannot be aligned as far as the accounting year of a joint venture which is outside India with the parent company. That is one problem which I am seeing. It is, there is no answer which I am seeing right now as per the act. I think a country of our size, if it cannot produce 100 companies, 100 chartered accountant firms, large who firms. can do this? And large or medium, as long as they are capable, it is enough. As the Companies Act 2013 wrung the death knell for ICAI's regulatory powers, and can one fraudulent audit partner drown the firm? Well, we've saved the best for last, or should I say, the most contentious, because in this third and final episode of discussing accounts and audit, we're going to focus on NFRA and auditor liabilities. The Companies Act 2013 gives birth to the National Financial Reporting Authority, or the NFRA. Its job will be to make recommendations to the government on accounting and auditing policies and standards, monitor and enforce compliance with these standards, and oversee the quality of service of accountants and auditors. The NFRA will have the power to investigate, adjudicate, penalize, and debar an accountant from practice and membership of the ICAI for up to 10 years. Say hello to India's audit super regulator. Is this the death of the ICAI? Uh, no. As a regulator? I'll give you the background of NFRA. Uh, I think the Prime Minister and the uh, whole country gave a commitment that the standard setting and regulation will be separated. NFRA was born out of that assurance that uh, the standard setting and regulation will be separated and uh, standard setting body will be the ICAI and regulator uh, disciplinary mechanism will lie with NFRA. Hmm. But in between we ended up removing both the standard setting <coughs> approval. Standard setting is still with ICI. Yeah. The approval, approval of standard setting as well as auditing standards have gone to NAFRA hmm. and disciplinary part of it has gone to NAFRA. Hmm. That is, it is only the top 200 companies which will be subjected to the auditors of those 200 companies, I'm saying rough figure, would be subjected to the disciplinary proceedings by the NFRA. Second is, the institute will still have all the role that it has to play if NFRA comes and decides to take a case, ICA will have no role to play in that. That's how you read it? No, that's the way it is. I'm sure Ramesh will agree with me on this. The second issue is, again, my earlier statement. I'm that not so sure about that, sir. I'm sure Ramesh will agree with me. I've taken an advance ruling from him. So you won't from him. <laughs> Very critical is that instead of strengthening institutions, are we weakening institutions? There are two acts of parliament, which one is ICA, one is... Uh, uh, Companies Act. You are creating NAFRA. We have uh, been working NACAS under the Companies Act. We have never had, a, he has been a member of Na, NACAS, we have never had any differences in standard setting. Whatever institute did, the NACAS also approved it or we changed it based on NACAS's requirement. In my opinion, there is an, uh, too much of a layer which is coming up. The second is, would you discipline a doctor's profession or a lawyer's profession by an external agency? You are singling out uh, the chartered accountants alone because I think uh, they are not the people who will come to streets and fight. Second, op my opinion is, as long as the institute could have done some errors, could have slipped on something, but uh, fundamental rights and the way the disciplinary mechanism proceeds, public perception is delayed. I think once that perception is corrected, it will, but I don't see NAFRA taking over ICA rule because it will take five years for them, correct me if I'm wrong, 200 companies auditors to be done is 500, it will take five years and it will involve a huge amount of uh, budget for them. I don't think they would be able to do and they won't be able to complete an inspection. An inspection typically with four members will take 60 days for a so company. So you're saying it's a non-startup? In my opinion, it will uh, be very difficult for it to function uh, in the manner in which uh, it has been thought of. It will have to have a huge setup 
and the benefit that will arise out of it will not uh, be commensurate with the money that you spend. Instead of that, strengthen ICI would be a lot better way of doing it. To be fair and honest, I did not intend to get into a very detailed debate on NFRA simply mm -hmm. because A, we have so many other issues and time is always mm -hmm. uh, short and B, I think NFRA deserves an entire episode Absolutely. of its own once we come closer to its, uh, you know, sort of actioning uh, because it could change things in many good or bad <coughs> ways as SK has just raised. But I'd still like to get quick comments reacting to what SK has laid out as the potential non-starterness of NFRA. Uh, Ramesh, would you agree? Because he says you... Uh, I don't want to say potentially non-starter, but it's going to be difficult for them to start unless there is a thought, well thought out process how you will do it. Where is the... Which doesn't where exist right now, you're No, saying. it doesn't. It, our ministry was aware of it. We wanted to do it later. But today, no. The, nobody has planned what are the infrastructure requirements for them. Yeah, let me make some very quick points. One, I agree with SK that standard setting should be left to experts and therefore ICI is the expert and should have been so. I know it's too late now to talk about uh, accounting standards which had already gone to NACAS and auditing standards also coming into NAFRA along with the accounting standards. But the second part is there is this International Forum of Independent Audit Regulators. If you are to be a member of that, it is important that your regulatory body which <coughs> oversees the auditing profession and audit is a very important public service function has to be independent of the profession hmm. it oversees. So it is in that context that, that uh, was yes. Having said that, SK is absolutely right. If you want to get that oversight of the audit profession, you need to have substance. You need to have independent inspectors. Mm. And resources. You, you, absolutely, you need to have a budget. And today it may be our firms which audit more than 200 audits, all of that. But the principle is, seems to be cast in stone in a way that there will be an independent oversight. It's as substance uh, So in happened. polite terms, you're saying you don't think it's a non-starter? Oh, you don't think No, I'm saying it's, it's a, a matter of time. Design. I'll never say it's a non-starter because we are you heading towards a, a regime design. all over the world where there will be an independent audit. You don't regular. think that the better option would have been to strengthen the ICI? You think that this is what where we no, should I'm have moved? I'm saying ICI is strong even today. It is possible. I'm we sure have the many mechanisms. No, no, that. no, I mean, no. I don't want to get into you know, in the terms of inspection and mechanisms, all that it's outsourced. All I'm saying is, irrespective of whether ICI is strong or weak, the principle of independent audit oversight is there across the world now, sure. and we have we will move towards that someday or the other. I just needed to add one. So, yes, one sir. is accounting standards and auditing standards. Even today, are only with the institute mm -hmm. under the Act. Nafra can only approve what has been done by the institute, so it has not been taken away. To your question, whether it is dead, no, because mm -hmm. under the law it says accounting standards and auditing standards, as set by ICI, will be approved by Nafra. Nafra cannot on its own set any standard. It has to come only through ICI. The second is even today the disciplinary mechanism we have majority of the members, I think out of six members, three members are government nominees. You could have made six members as government nominees only with two from the ICI. The same disciplinary mechanism which is there could have easily been strengthened rather than creating an institutional So you spending. think honestly no, no, that three. the disciplinary mechanism in the ICI has worked effectively? It has not worked effectively, not because ICA did not do it. Because you take such a case, I'm glad to take that case. People go to High Court and people go to Supreme Court and take stay and come back. And you cannot, you're not a policeman, you cannot go and arrest a person and come back. You have to ask for records. It takes time. I'm not saying everything is great and there is no fault at all. There could have been some fault. Perceptions are there, but as a disciplinary authority, you cannot go and publicize what you have done. But I think it did not warrant a complete change from the disciplinary mechanism. No, but the issue is not of delay because you will have, could have the same issue with NFRA too. If there is a judicial process which has to be followed or a quasi-judicial process, that has to be followed even by NFRA. That is not the issue. There are three elements here. Setting of standards, oversight on the profession which is inspecting of audit firms, and third is punishment which is the disciplinary proceedings. All three are today with NFRA. Even assuming that the disciplinary proceedings were re to remain with ICAI, the inspection of audit firms would require an independent oversight 
an audit regulator, and that is how NFRA would come in. That is where the resources would be an issue. In terms of time frame of disciplinary proceedings, I'm not sure NFRA would be able to make it far, much faster than the institute because of the process. I don't think it's explained. about faster. It's about being more effective and actually going after people besides just the Satyam case. But like I said, I don't want this to be a debate because True. that debate is a whole different yeah, debate on whether ICI is delivered or not. Therefore, whether NFRA has space to you know grow and thrive or not and whether the companies act. This is what it is now. So uh, your views, you know, we spent two years after Satyam asking, why doesn't India have a PCAOB kind of structure or a setup, right? Is this, you think, the answer to that? Yeah, so uh, again, I think anything that helps us move closer to international norms with the right safeguards is the right thing. D is, does this? I think, I think it does as long as you create the infrastructure behind this. Uh, because as, as we talked about, you, you know, when, when the PCOB was formed, the PCOB had hundreds of millions of dollars of funding to recruit the right people to make sure this works efficiently. Our ability to put in that infrastructure is questionable. Uh, and, and therefore, I, I think it's a step in the right direction. Uh, and all we need to do is make sure we create the infrastructure behind it. The only thing is, uh, PCOB had inspected Satya. So don't think that uh, everything is going to be. Right. Right. So yeah. PCOB came and inspected and they gave a clean report and then you got it. So if you think PCOB is going to solve all the problem. I, I deal with the PCOB on a daily basis uh, and, my, and I have clients who deal with them on a, on a regular basis. Let me tell you how companies and auditors deal with the PCOB is very different from the way they deal with the I institute. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that's the point. The point is not that anybody will catch everything 100%. But the, but the level of rigor you put in into an international audit, because you know there's the regulator, you know, who's an independent regulator, I think there is merit to that. And who has that. teeth. There, there and is, who has there, teeth. There, there right. is merit I'm, to I'm that. I'm sorry, I have to tell you this. The delivery system in the United States is much faster than us. Sure. It is not the regulator who is getting the, who is threatening you. There is a delivery system. Legal delivery system and enforcement systems are right there. Therefore, it PCOB is effective. Here it is not good. Therefore, ICA cannot be effective. I Mr. think, uh, okay. sorry. No, Mr. Ahead. Rao, you know, this is an emotive topic, actually. Yeah. I would have highest ratings if I spend the next one hour just discussing <laughs> this because every accountant in the country would be watching. Unfortunately, it's not everything that we need to discuss in the Companies Act. So I'll give the last word to you on this. Do you think that what we are getting in the form of NFRA, currently in the design stage, is the answer to the question, does India have an independent audit regulator? Does this fulfill those needs? Yeah, even today, what is envisaged that as far as the accounting standard setting is concerned, that is still with ICA, as rightly pointed out. Yeah. So only approval and making it effective, that is only the role. As Mr. Ramesh has pointed out, as long as oversight is with a regulator, I think it will be effective, in my view. Okay. So without undermining the role of ICA <laughs> and having <laughs> a Mr. oversight. Now is being political now. <laughs> now you're being political, sir. <laughs> Actually, that may be true. Hmm. Oversight function should be independent. So that oversight function, as long as this uh, new agency is going to fill up, I think it is a welcome step in my view. Companies Act, a special presentation by The Firm. Section 140, subsection 5. The tribunal, either suo moto or on an application made to it by the central government or by any person concerned, if it is satisfied that the auditor of a company has, whether directly or indirectly, acted in a fraudulent manner or abetted or colluded in any fraud, it may, by order, direct the company to change its auditors. Such an order would bar that auditor from being appointed as auditor of any company for five years. Section 140 goes on to explain that the liability shall be of all the partners that colluded in the fraud as well as that of the firm. Similarly, Section 147 also mentions liability, whether civil or criminal, shall be of the partner or partners concerned of the audit firm and of the firm jointly and severally. The rules attempt to narrow that scope by saying in case of criminal liability of any audit firm, the liability other than fine shall devolve only on the concerned partner or partners. Now on to penalties. While the Act levies similar penalties on defaulting companies and on auditors, an auditor can be punished with imprisonment only in the case of willful deception. If convicted, 
the auditor is liable to refund remuneration and pay damages. Fundamentally, the earlier law, there was nothing wrong with it. The liability was on the person who signed the financial statements. You don't penalize the firm and bring down the whole firm merely because of the fault of one partner. That in the rules and so far, and so far as it deals with criminal liability has been brought out very, Only concerned very partners, clearly. Yeah. And the principle should be that if the firm on a recurring basis has these issues, then you need to take action at a firm level in terms of the firm has not instituted processes in place. So I get it, but you are suggesting what it should be. I am saying what does it amount to? Well, it, it amounts to here. Uh, Criminal liability has been circumscribed just to the concerned partners. Correct. But civil liability now applies to the partner, the partners and the firm. Firms. We'll have to wait and see as to how it is actually applied in practice, really Sir? speaking. The principle that if one patient dies, you don't close the hospital, that has not been applied here. If one partner does a mistake, the whole of the partnership will take a liability is wrong. Well, at least the whole hospital won't go to jail. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but, but that's, the, that's a criminal but The entire hospital it. might no, get penalized. Just asking on the impact of this. No, yeah. impact of, I'm, I'm yeah. coming to the impact. Impact of it is going to be severe because it's impossible for you to control all the partners. Unless you have proved connivance and partners working together to do it. I'll also give you the background why it happened. When it came to a disciplinary committee, the partner who was responsible for it said, I had a review partner. The review partner said there was a quality partner who did that. I'm, I'm telling you the background, why an exception is led to your rule. But uh, each person tried to escape saying, I did it, but there's also a quality partner. And quality partner said, I didn't sign it, so you can't hold me responsible. But I had a review partner. So each one was trying to shift the blame to the other, and they tried to escape. So for an exception, in that case, come and said, put a rule, and all the partners will be responsible. In my view, this is too harsh a provision. Hmm. It should not be, I think we should uh, aim at uh, making a change to this, to the amendment to the Act. But that partner being both civilly responsible and criminally responsible. If the whole partnerships were acted in connivance, and they all derived the benefit out of it, knowing fully well he has done something wrong, then you can take uh, penal action on the firm and cancel the license. So you're saying just like the criminal liability has been circumscribed, the civil should liability should also be circumscribed. Unless proved that there is connivance. Unless proved that there is a connivance by sure, other partners. If there is yes. proof, then you're part, party to the fault. So for concerned the auditors, I mean yes. I'm using the word, if it's concerned auditors in the sense that you've been proven to be party to the fraud, then the liability, whether criminal or civil, should apply to you as well. So this is Fair one enough? more case for Section 417. No, this won't be Section 417. No, it's a, it has to go through the amendment to the Act. But unfortunately, while you have not provided penal provisions for other things, for the auditors you have levied heavy penal provisions. While you have restricted the audit profession from probably rotation, and non-audit services, etc., you also <coughs> end up with a severe penal provisions. And I think ultimately this will this will show up in the pricing of audit services because nobody is doing this for charity. Uh, and I think ultimately the risk will have to be priced in. And the, and whether it is in terms of increased efforts, whether it is in terms of you know how you conduct an audit, it'll, it'll find that out was the, the most piece. important <laughs> impact. In that. Two hours of discussion that we've had. Basically, sir, what they're telling you is they're going to send you a bigger bill, uh, <laughs> starting FY15. No, no, let me also tell you there are not many women who want to come and join the practice at all. They say we won't sign the balance sheet. Why? Uh, because you you may have to go inside because something else went wrong in a company. I may have to have civil and criminal liability. Many women, I'm not sure that you have many women, they have said we won't we sign the balance sheet. Okay. They don't want to. That's unfortunate collateral damage. Okay. The auditors look fatigued, tired, beaten down, sir. Should I give you the last word on what these two chapters really mean? Because the, at the end of the day, this is an act that regulates companies. It's not an act that's meant to regulate accountants. So from the company point of view, at the end of the day, what do you think the ultimate impact is? Is business become too difficult to do because of these two chapters? Yeah, it, it, particularly the consolidation of accounts and uh, the related parties transactions uh, where it has to be disclosed to the director's report <clears throat> and subsidiaries related uh, uh, disclosures so these are the issues which will uh, uh, delay the entire uh, the process of doing business i think it has to be relooked as far as these particular uh, areas are concerned similarly the penalties which are there today not only to auditors even if we take from the company point of view hmm. So every section talks about imprisonment and fine. Hmm. So it is not that it is uh, severe on uh, auditors, it is severe on companies, severe on 
managements, uh, professionals, executives, executives, and everybody. Directors. It is, very, it is very, very severe. So, cost of compliance is very, very high. So, therefore, the industry has to be uh, uh, has to be very vigilant in ensuring that the compliances are done properly. So, one way it is good. Governance system will improve as far as India is concerned, but it will take long time to adjust to the new act. All right, gentlemen, I'm going to let that be the last word. I thank you all for your time. Next week on Companies Act, compromises, arrangements and amalgamations. If you look at the draft rules again, uh, you know, they said that deal merger needs to be aligned or, you know, with the tax definition. That's right. uh, and therefore, I think the question that will come is, you know, is it the cart before the horse or the horse before <laughs> the cart? So we have a Companies Act, which is now trying to address tax and stamp duty by virtue of a provision under the Companies Act. Hopefully, I'm only hoping it will work very beautifully if no sector regulation for that matter will go back after the merger is saying, no, I want to look at a fresh. Then there is a problem because still moving in circles. If you look at cross-border mergers, you look at fast-track mergers, I mean, the last act had a life of 57 years, right? Mm. And this is a, you can call it enabling provision today. But when you think of it, maybe 10 years down the line, when indeed Indian m is more aligned with global m and I think you've created uh, something that can facilitate. So you're delighted with all the no, I'm saying enabling we're not, that we're this not, act is laid out. I don't see we'll it. hold you to this for 10 years, <laughs> I reach this opinion. Maybe, uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't I don't see us being at least worse off, is, is my overall take. When I just look at this particular What chapter. a relief, at least we're not worse <laughs> off. <laughs> Companies Act, a special presentation by The Firm.